Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, this evening's talk by um, our fellow. It's a great pleasure to welcome Louisa in a different role this evening. Um, Louisa Beavashevich, I hope I've got that one right, uh, is uh, the um, Bronislav Geremic uh, Fellow at the IWM uh, this year and has a project which is actually a historical uh, project called Other Empires, Other Europe's, Europe Beyond Territory. She is a political geographer, as maybe the title of her project here leads you to guess. It examines the relationship between territory and the European idea, the idea thinking about political, geographical imaginations of political communities in a historical perspective in uh, Europe. This evening's lecture will probably draw from some of the material in the project, as you can already see here in the first slide. It's on the geopolitics of visibility, where she will be talking about the right to appear, the right to be seen in public in European cities, and our understanding of who can be seen, who can appear, where, and in what context. She's going to talk about not only the imagined geographies of Islamic presence in today's Europe, but to go back to Italian examples using her own uh, research. Luisa is a political geographer and the Jamonet Professor of EU External Relations in the Department of European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Before she moved to Netherlands, she was a senior lecturer in the Department of Geography at the Royal Holloway University of London, and before that at the University of Durham. Her work, her work has focused actually on European integration and geopolitics of the EU. And of course, a particular focus has been European borders and migration, a topic which could not have been timelier. So welcome, and thank you for agreeing to give this evening's talk. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. <laughs> okay. So um, just one quick word. I'm hoping my voice will hold, because it disappeared this morning, but I've got some amazing Austrian tablets that apparently all the opera singers here use. And I was told by the pharmacist that these will work miracles. So just in case they don't, I have the tube here that I can keep um, uh, taking from. So um, uh, Shalini already, I think, mentioned that my project here focuses in part on Venice, because I uh, think many of you may have been wondering why on earth pictures of Venice accompanied the announcements for this presentation, especially these turbaned figures um, that stand in the Campo dei Mori. Um, in part, it has to do with that, because as, as Shalini mentioned, the project that I'm working on here looks at particular imaginations of political community in the Venetian Republic, and especially the ways in which Venice engaged with its various others, um, with the Byzantine and later Ottoman worlds, but not only. Um, so what interests me is how um, this political community was represented in geographical ways, through cartographic representation, but also how Venice actively built in, let's say, um, these others into the physical spaces of the city as a testament also to its power over those lands, over the um, Adriatic and Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and those of you who have passed through Venice will immediately recognize some of these traces, whether it is these bronze horses that adorn um, the Basilica of St. Mark, um, stolen um, during the Fourth Crusade, just as most of the pillars and the bar relief on the Basilica um, from Constantinople, or other more, let's say, noble acts of looting, um, such as the translatio of the body of St. Mark from Alexandria. And here you see the painting by Tintoretto that hangs in the Galleria dell'Accademia from the 1500s, showing the Venetian merchants carrying the body away. Um, so in all of these ways, and I want to leave St. Mark's body here for us, and I'll come to it 
in a second, because it has relevance for us in the contemporary period as well. Um, this material incorporation of Eastern spolia okay, into the actual physical landscape of the city was a crucial part in sustaining Venice's um, both, let's say, geopolitical and spiritual claims to all those lands. So in sustaining the fact that it was both a geopolitical and spiritual heir to Constantinople. Um, although its power was already waning in the 1500s when Tintoretto was commissioned to paint this painting, one of the reasons for which the Doge of the time um, requested him to do that. Um, but one of the reasons that I wanted to start with pictures of Venice is because the um, event that I want to use as a, let's say, a kind of clue for the talk um, happened in Venice just last year during the 2015 Venice Biennale, which is one of the contemporary art world's most important manifestations. And I want to use this event um, to try to draw our attention, you know, albeit in a kind of uh, small way, um, to some of the ways in which the fear of Muslim presence is becoming a fetish in today's Europe. Um, a fetish because it is on the one hand entirely removed from its referent and at the same time all-encompassing, okay? totalizing. It is a fetish because it provokes what Michael Fisher termed an emotional excess. And when Fisher um, uh, used this phrase, he was writing about the Danish Muhammad cartoon controversy a few years ago. And I think adopting the idea of the fetish, and that's why I leave the body of St. Mark up here for you to ponder, it's useful, and I think it's useful both analytically but also politically. I think it's useful to better understand what is happening today, but also to depotentiate it to strip away some of its fatally attractive power, both in uh, populist discourses, but also increasingly in uh, mainstream politics. And I'm certainly not the only one to argue this um, and to make use of this notion of the fetish. Um, and in the way that I want to use it today in, in this talk, um, I take it uh, from uh, the ways in it was conceived by um, Emmanuel Terre. Um, and Terre, writing a decade ago, um, right in the midst of the first set of headscarf debates in France, um, used this notion, I think, quite provocatively. What I want to do, though, is, in a sense, add a spatial component to Terre's analysis, if only because I'm a geographer, but also because I think it's very important to understand how this fetish works in and through spaces, both real and imagined spaces. So in the essay that Touré publishes in 2004 on New Left Review, entitled Headscarf Hysteria, that many of you will be familiar with, he begins his analysis actually by drawing upon the work of an author who many of you will be familiar with, um, Istvan Bibo writing about the role of the fetish in interwar politics. And this is what Touré writes, and, and let me quote directly from his piece. When a community fails to find within itself the means or energy to deal with a problem that challenges, if not its existence, then at least its way of being and self-image, it may be tempted to adopt a pe peculiar defensive ploy. It will substitute a fictional problem, which can be mediated purely through words and symbols, for a real one, which it finds insurmountable. In grappling with the former, the community can convince itself that it has successfully confronted the latter. It experiences a sense of relief and thus feels able to continue on as before. And I want us to keep in mind this power of substitution that Terre um, writes about because I think it's very relevant for us today when we consider the ways in which the obsession with Muslim presences is manifesting itself in European cities. Because it is through this power of substitution that the fetish can gather everything into itself. It is no longer about a specific individual, a specific action or event, or a specific place. It becomes about, you know, about religion with a capital R, 
civilization with a capital C in the kind of unfortunate Huntingtonian idea. And since it is a fetish, the reaction is to destroy it, to remove it, to eliminate it physically or to at least eliminate it from our view, believing that if we do so, the bigger problem will somehow go away and giving us that kind of sense of relief that Terre identifies. Now, using this idea of the fetish, I don't want to in any way discount the various also violent reactions across Europe today because they speak to real fears, to real concerns. What I want to do, rather, is to get us to think what other ways we have of conceiving and addressing these concerns, these fears that do not rely on fetishizing, that do not rely on what is at once geographical reduction and magnification, spatial simplification and spatial hyperbole. Okay? Because space and contests over space, especially urban spaces, are absolutely crucial to this. And in this sense, um, I, I want to take Therese's analysis somewhat further. So, let me tell you the story of um, Venice that I want to begin with. And it is the story of the mosque. The mosque, if you can imagine, in capital letters, because that was the name of the exhibit at the Venice Biennale that the story is going to be about. The exhibit was the Icelandic national contribution to the Biennale that lasted only two weeks, um, even though it says on this newspaper article that I have up here from the local Venice paper, only 10 days. It lasted two weeks before being shut down by the local authorities citing health and safety measures. When the uh, exhibition is presented, the Icelandic Art Center, that is the official sponsor, um, says that this is, quote, merely a visual analog of a mosque. The problem is that the installation became something else when the local Muslim community began to actually use it as a site for gathering and prayers, an all too real performance that quickly brought vicious protests and um, very quickly the exhibit's early closure. So the mosque was the work um, actually of a Swiss artist working for the Icelandic commission, um, Christoph Buchel. And prior to the Venice um, installation, Buchel had already um, created similar kind of fake real spaces that intervened directly into urban space, um, such as a community center in London, the Piccadilly Community Center. For the Venice installation, um, Buchel chose a deconsecrated church, a church that was already deconsecrated in the 1970s. It's the Santa Maria della Misericordia in the Canareggio district. And this is what it is, and this is what it looked like during the exhibit's um, operation. When the exhibit was um, on, so from the 8th of May through the 22nd of May, even though it was supposed to run through November, which was the duration of the Biennale, this beautiful white Baroque facade of the former church in fact, gave no indication whatsoever from the exterior that it was an exhibition space. So unlike other Biennale exhibits that took over um, various spaces in Venice, apart from the Arsenale and the Giardini, where the main um, bulk of the exhibition was contained, you, know, uh, you could not see, them. I mean, there were no panels, there was no indication from the outside that this was somehow part of the artistic kermesse. Only once inside, once you went through the door, um, the glass panels of this inside wooden door announced um, on the one side um, Centro Culturale Islamico di Venezia, so the Islamic Center of Venice, and the Mosque of the Misericordia. And a very quick kind of uh, apology here um, for the very bad quality of these pictures. I went there um, the day before the exhibit shut, not knowing that it would shut. Nobody knew it was going to be shut forcibly. So I went there with my iPhone, took very few pictures, um, counting on coming back the next day with a proper camera. So um, apologies for, yes, and you know, this is probably the worst of those pictures because it actually shows me trying to take a picture with my iPhone of the inside of the mosque. Anyway, um, so you know, you'd walk inside and only entering into um, the building you'd be able to tell that this is indeed um, uh, the exhibit. On a little table um, along, alongside the door, um, there was a series of flyers that were also being distributed outside 
featuring text in English, um, in Arabic, um, and in Italian, um, you know, inviting uh, visitors to visit this first mosque, the first mosque in the historic city of Venice, um, providing, you know, kind of the address, directions from the train station, from the main parking structure, and so on. And actually, apart from the web address that was provided on the flyer with a very strange IS extension, here too, I mean, it was very hard to tell that this was actually the exhibit. And only if you flip the flyer in a very kind of small print on the back, it said, Icelandic contribution to the 56th International Art Exhibition, the Biennale di Venezia, Christoph Buchel in collaboration with the Muslim communities of Venice and Iceland. So once inside, um, the main nave of the deconsecrated church was converted into a space that was supposed to resemble that of a mosque prayer hall with a prayer carpet um, covering the whole space and other attributes of what should have been a functioning mosque. So a mihrab niche indicating the direction of Mecca um, that was created between the former altar spaces, a minbar from which the imam could uh, address the congregation, and so on. Okay? Um, apart from this prayer space, and actually um, one of the great um, kind of... Uh, rallying points for the municipality was the area for ablutions in the back. In a room to the side um, was a little information center with a bookshop um, selling various Islamic texts, prayer paraphernalia, a children's corner, a library, a kind of computer terminal, and so on. And um, on the day of my visit, so the day um, before the closure on 21st of May, there were quite a number of visitors milling about both inside, taking pictures, looking at the information that was being presented here, um, reading the various flyers and so on, including um, one that was being distributed, um, uh, kind of describing in Italian, and curiously enough, this was only um, provided in Italian, what is um, Islam. And it was really hard to tell if the people coming in, because no ticket was being charged. I mean, you had to pay to get into the Biennale exhibits, but here there was you know, no tickets at the door. So it was hard to tell if these were people who had gone to the Biennale exhibits or other tourists that were drawn to this place, attracted by the amazing publicity that it got both in the Italian and European press. At the same time, um, there were a number of young men who were within the prayer area um, and actively using it. And in fact, within the installation, and I'll just go back here, there was um, a delimitation between what was to be kind of the religious space and the non-religious place with instructions to visitors to remove their shoes should they wish to enter this area of prayer. And it was precisely these instructions and the attempt at delimiting a religious space within the installation that served as the pretext for the first protests against the mosque. Um, by, quote, citizens' committees who lodged a formal protest with the local authorities um, just a couple of days after the installation opening, noting that the, since this was not an authorized place of worship, rules pertaining to places of worship could not be enforced. And again, the shoe question became a particular rallying point, with several of the protesters forcibly entering that space in shoes. Okay, um, to quote, see what these people will do to us, as one particularly um, feisty woman uh, declared to the interviewer from La Repubblica newspaper. And this was what she said. And this was a quote that then, of course, got picked up by all the Italian media. These people who consider women as inferior, how dare they try to impose their rules on a work of art here in our Venice and on us. Just try to keep your shoes on and see what happens. What would happen, in fact, would be absolutely nothing, since the suggestion was exactly that, a suggestion um, regarding the use of that part of the space. And in fact, the Icelandic Art Council responded to the controversy formally within a matter of hours, noting that, quote, visitors to the mosque are not required to remove their shoes or cover their heads with veils. Inside the exhibition, um, there's a sign suggesting that visitors remove their shoes as part of the performance, as part of the installation, and as a way of um, uh, respecting the cleanliness of the site. Veils are also provided for optional use for anyone who would wish to um, experiment in using them. It's entirely left up to the visitors to choose whether to remove their shoes or whether to try wearing a veil. Now, um, there are over um, 20,000 Muslims who live and work in Venice, in Venice itself, not on the terraferma, not on the mainland. 
and for, who for 15 years had been campaigning to have a prayer site within the city without having to travel to the mainland. So the project for the mosque was actually um, thought up by Buchel in collaboration with the local Islamic community and um, the Association of Muslims in Iceland. And um, you know, in all the interviews that the artist gave, he said that it was both um, an attempt to provide an albeit temporary meeting and prayer space, but also um, to very much kind of invoke um, Venice's long-standing connections with the East and Middle East. Now, the connections that Buhol wanted to allude to were, of course, the ones that I already mentioned in part. Venice's long history as a maritime trading republic, whose power at its height stretched across the Adriatic and the Mediterranean, um, as Europe's gate to the Orient um, that John Ruskin beautifully described as the center of the world that brought together Roman, Gothic, and Byzantine influences. Um, it was actually uh, in Venice that the first printed edition of the Quran was made in the 16th century, and it was Venice that was for several centuries, the key interchange point for ideas and goods between Europe and the Near East. The painting that you see here uh, by Gentile Bellini, the reception of the Venetian ambassadors in Damascus um, that hangs in the Louvre, is, uh, I think, a wonderful example of the ways in which the Venetians actively drew upon this vision of themselves as very much not just the gate to, to the Orient, but also, as I was saying earlier, the heir to Constantinople, um, using this uh, very particular understanding of its political and economic role in the Mediterranean and the Levant. <coughs> and the city today is very much still a testament to that, whether through the Byzantine influence or um, direct, directly looted architectural pieces of its key landmarks, to countless other material traces that really speak to these ties um, with the Near East and um, the Ottoman lands, such, again, as the turbaned figures that I used at the outset that stand in the Campo dei Mori. But also, actually, um, Piazza San Marco itself, um, the very heart of Venice, whose original size and shape was modeled directly on the great Umayyad Mosque in Damascus before it was widened in the 16th century. Um, and I was trying to find a better picture um, you know, that would allow you to see some of these similarities, but the, you know, kind of the, the arcades, I mean, it's not a very good, again, comparison here, were very much a direct um, inspiration. And the reason I mention this is because I think it's particularly important today to remember some of those shared histories to think that once upon a time, Damascus and Venice were part of the very same Mediterranean world, and I think, and continued to inspire one another directly. And I think it's important, especially today, when the temptation to fetishize difference and to distance those arriving at Europe's shores is so strong. Um, but these shared histories were definitely not the ones that the opponents of the mosque wanted to see made visible in Venice's historical center. Led by politicians from uh, the far-right Fratelli d'Italia party, but also the separatist Lega Nord that actually holds the regional governorship in the Veneto right now, pickets began outside of the installation the very day that it opened. Um, the Fratelli Italia representative, Sebastiano Costalonga, thundered, this is an unauthorized place of worship. It is not a work of art. It must be closed immediately. Um, and also requested um, the Venice municipality that since the exhibition was distributing propaganda materials, such as those various pamphlets, the party should have permission to also distribute informational material to citizens to let citizens, quote, know what is really happening. And while... Uh, various politicians focused most of their kind of legal challenge on the mosque's operation as an unauthorized place of worship. The protests on the street from these various citizens' committees um, focused on a different set of um, questions. So um, as you approached the installation, you saw plastered all over the construction site right in front of it, and previously uh, being handed out, a series of leaflets, and this is one of them. I will read you the Italian. Um, Iceland, as part of the 2015 Venice Biennale, created a mosque 
in the Church of the Santa Maria della Misericordia, violating and desecrating a symbol of our Christianity, culture, and historical memory. Remember, the church was deconsecrated in the 1970s. It was used for receptions, parties, all kinds of other things. Let's get back to the flyer. Let us all stand up to this offensive and provocative act by a nation that appears to have still remained barbarians. This is the Icelanders. Okay? Boycott all of their products and tourist business. And do not buy any made in Iceland, with an, actually made in Ireland, products, or in the case of fish, those with labels, fished or raised in the northern seas. Okay? Now, as you can see, the flyers um, featured uh, very prominently in their center what was meant to be the Icelandic flag, but obviously these guys <laughs> didn't study their geography and actually used the British flag <laughs> instead, which um, kind of drew very kind of curious uh, stares and giggles from the tourists um, passing by. Okay? Um, and, you know, and, and this is uh, offered here by the spontaneous committee of the, those uh, indignati, um, kind of... Uh, I'm just trying to think of what would be good to kind of uh, who are outraged for the profanation of the church. Okay. Another set of flyers, and obviously here, some, and unfortunately, I couldn't get any that hadn't been destroyed, um, that were also um, either being given out or plastered around um, the installation, appealed to a different set of imagined geographies and histories to oppose the mosques. These featured the Madonna di Nicopea. It's the icon of the Virgin of Nicopea that since the 13th century hangs in St. Mark's Basilica, having been looted from Constantinople, curiously enough, okay, as part of the spoliar of the Fourth Crusade. And as legend has it, since that time, Venetians have been particularly devoted to this Madonna, and the icon um, has supposedly protected them um, in uh, times of pestilence, from war, etc., etc. And let me read you the text on this flyer. Um, Saint Virgin Nicopea, we as your children, afflicted by the sacrilegious profanation of your monastery, as in the past for the struggle against pestilence and wars of self-preservation, pray to you. Take up, O beacon of victory, the humble prayer of your people. Confirm their faith, sustain their hope, protect your church in all adverse circumstances, and come to assistance in this hour of need. Now, appeals to divine protection against the profanation of a uh, putatively Christian-only space are not new in the Veneto and certainly not new in um, Italian political discourse. And the reason for which they work and they resonate is because they appeal once more to a much longer standing set of symbolic geographies promoted by the Lega Nord, um, but also other right-of-center politicians focused on this threat of a putative Muslim invasion of Europe um, decried as Eurabia. Okay, and this is not only in Italy, but in Italy, this discourse of Eurabia or Eurabia has been very strong. And a lot of these imaginations that started um, emerging already in the late 1980s, early 2000s, have engaged language and geographical imaginations lifted directly from the Crusades, um, with some pundits infamously prognosticating a, quote, Islamic reverse crusade that will threaten to submerge and subjugate Europe. And this is the writers in the, uh, in, uh, kind of prognosticating this idea of Eurabia through a creeping colonization of European cities by the infidel. And you know, the, the person who was most prominent in spreading these ideas was the now deceased Italian journalist Oriana Fallaci. But she was not only the one. And again, I think it's important to remember these genealogies um, today when we listen to Kaczynski and when we listen to Orban um, and their own invocations of crusading metaphors and the need to protect Europe and Europeans against pestilence because they have a much longer history. And I think it's also important um, to remember this longer genealogy so we don't draw other false dividing lines across Europe, you know, delimiting the moral and righteous West um, from the racist and intolerant East. Because unfortunately, these racist imaginaries are shared. But let us return to how such protection narratives were invoked in the case of the mosque. It was, in fact, the need to protect the Venetian public, not from some undefined pestilence or you know, uh, Muslim hordes, that became the excuse to shut down the mosque, um, just as I said, two weeks after its opening. 
When the local authorities forcibly closed the installation down on the 22nd of May, it is not because of any um, violation of religious or cultural sensibilities or even the lack of a permit for a uh, proper place of worship. The Procura, so the, the Venice authority that regulates building codes and so on, announces that the mosque would be shut down for, quote, public health reasons, citing sanitary and fire safety regulations that, you know, interestingly, that apply to real places of worship and public gathering spaces. The collage of um, pictures that you see here, and they come from the local newspaper, La Nuova Venezia, in fact, um, you know, show this teeming place. And as a particular offense, this was a picture that you know, made the rounds in the Venetian newspapers, a pair of socks hanging off the holy water font, you know, kind of speaking of the profanation. So the mosque became literally a fetish to be destroyed, gathering into it much longer standing fears and prejudices that, with its closure, presumably were at least partially um, assuaged. And since public authorities cannot speak in the language of fetish, um, the appeal was to the language of public health and public safety in order to shut it down. Now, this episode was in some ways unique in that the contest over the presence of an Islamic space of worship pertained to a fake mosque, not a real space of worship. But I think that's why it is um, so useful and so revealing of the kind of the fetish-like nature granted to Muslim spaces and Muslim bodies in European cities today. Because even though it was not real, it, provide, it, it provided and provoked a very real emotional excess of the sort that There talks about, a very real set of popular and political reactions. <coughs> Um, nevertheless, this story, the story of the Biennale Mosque, reflects many similar contests um, over the building of real mosques in Italy as well as in Europe more broadly. We can think of the Swiss referendum um, on proposing a ban on minarets in 2009 that I will remind you was voted by an almost 60% yes majority. Or in Italy, again, um, a long-running legal challenge, um, uh, an attempt by the Lombardy region that is governed by the Lega to impose a ban on mosque construction. And this proposed regional law was in fact just struck down by the Italian Constitutional Court in February um, in a unanimous decision. And uh, that law is interesting because even uh, you know, even the Lega could not get away with directly banning the construction of mosques. So the proposed piece of legislation centered on the question of proper appearance. It forbade the edification of buildings with bell towers that were too high and buildings that, quote, would be in conflict architecturally with the Lombard landscape. Um, in Venice right now, actually, right um, across the lagoon on the mainland in Tessera, um, right across from the Venice airport, and you will see it when you go to Venice, and the airport that is named, of course, after famed explorer of the Orient, Marco Polo, a new mosque is being built, and most of the debates have focused exactly on this question of visibility. As long as it is an inconspicuous structure that will blend into the warehouses and car dealerships that line that strip of land, um, no one will complain, as one commentator on the local paper put it. And this again you know, reflects very similar debates um, and dynamics across Europe. Um, colleagues working in the UK and in Germany have noted how kind of invisible Islamic spaces, so the so-called storefront mosques that occupy mundane buildings, have not aroused the same kind of reactions that purpose-built mosques have. As, uh, as my colleague Dan Swanton has argued, they're, quote, spatially inconspicuous to non-attendees and thus absent in their presence. So they don't hold the same you know, fetish-like um, characteristics. Um, having said that, um, and, and this is important, such attitudes are shifting and have shifted um, quite considerably in recent years because it is now precisely such hidden informal mosques that become the main um, kind of focus of security concerns, their invisibility um, exactly a marker of their potential to harbor danger. And I don't have the time here, you know, kind of to address this different set of fetishized geographical imaginations of the enemy within lurking in the outskirts of Belgian, French or Dutch cities. 
but there is a very powerful set of understandings of urban spaces um, that, that is, is certainly calls for critical attention. But um, in closing, um, and to move away from the mosque um, into a broader, I think, set of geographies and fetishes, I want to return now to this question of protection and securitization. Um, and the sort of securitizing narratives that underpin the debates over the mosque, but broader debates right now about the need to protect European cities and European bodies from a Muslim threat. Now, as I mentioned to you, the appeals to protection of the local population from a creeping Islamic invasion in northern Italy um, had a longer genealogy, an invasion that had long been envisioned not just as a cultural war, but as a direct bodily threat. Now, this horrible cartoon that you see here actually comes from a set of flyers that the Lega Nord was distributing in 2001 on uh, Piazza San Marco as part of its annual Padania Day celebrations. Um, and we will unfortunately recognize all too well um, the racialized depictions here because they have reappeared in the European public imaginary in the past months. Perhaps, you know, not this explicitly um, racialized, but not much different. And um, I'll show you here two magazine covers that many of you will have seen from Poland and from Germany, again, not to draw false distinctions about moral um, right, appealing to the very same logic of protection with now not just the safety of our streets, but the safety of European women's bodies invoked as a security imperative. Now, both of these covers speak to the aftermath of the criminal events in Cologne and other cities. Um, and I call them criminal events because that's exactly what they were, criminal. But yet again, a very powerful manifestation of the fetish-like workings of the fear of Muslim presence in European cities today. And again, the power of the fetish derives exactly from the fact that it gathers everything into itself. It is not about a specific set of events, in this case criminal, another a specific set of individuals, a specific set of places, but about the arrival of a, quote, Neanderthal civilization, as um, one Austrian politician unfortunately put it, recently. Because the popular and political rhetoric of the catalogue of potential dangers to Europe and Europeans, represented by large-scale migration from the Muslim world, has now expanded its reach. From the refugee as potential terrorist, we have now come to the refugee as also potential rapist, molester, and abductor of European women. And this rhetoric traces a very clear geography of who is to be feared, whose presence should be vigilated upon in city streets. Um, with, in this case, the threat of sexual violence delimited to only one specific population, reliant on a series of bodily and geographical distinctions constituting the good men who will protect their women and children in relation to the bad men who are liable to attack. And once more, this is another one of the Lega um, flyers from 2001, but that have been um, brought back to the public um, imaginary. And you know, I, I don't have time, I mean, this would constitute probably another talk, if not another two talks, to talk about um, you know, the, the very long um, colonial legacies of such logics of protection, but also, you know, kind of in a shorter term perspective, the ways in which they have been invoked in the post 9-11 era um, instrumentally, um, with in particular, and here I'll quote from Judith Butler, um, using women's sexual freedom and safety to wage cultural assaults on Islam, both at home and abroad. And this was, Butler was writing this 10 years ago. So how do we respond to this academically, politically? How do we respond to these narratives? How do we depotentiate, um, disrupt the fetish and its powers of simplification? So artistic performance can certainly be one way of doing it. And I think the Venice Mosque story certainly um, speaks to that. Um, if we want to um, follow um, Jacques Rancière's argument, artistic practices hold precisely 
that kind of disruptive potential or can hold that kind of disruptive potential since, as he says, they intervene in the general distribution of ways of doing and making. They intervene into what is made visible, what can be made visible and how into the properties of spaces, as he says, and the possibilities of time. And the curator of the Biennale this past year, um, Okui and Visor, referred to not just this exhibit, but many of the exhibits that made up um, the Biennale, precisely in terms of this political potential and what he called um, thinking of them as machines of spatial disorder. Okay? And I thought that was wonderful. So. Um, Exhibits, performances that would allow us to somehow question the taken for granted properties of space, um, the taken for granted geographies of what should be where, and also who has the right to be where. Um, and artistic performance, in that sense, um, can be a way um, of somehow, I say, I, you know, we can think of undoing the spell of the fetish if we think of it really in anthropological terms, for revealing it for what it is, okay? for reducing it. So I wanted to close this rather depressing presentation with an appeal to this power of the absurd, with an example that actually a Finnish colleague um, brought to my attention, thank you, <laughs> Inka, um, um, that looks at a manifestation um, that uh, emerged as a response to these events in, Flin in Finland as elsewhere um, in order to address the security threat supposedly posed by Muslim migrants. So in Finland, um, and now I've uh, just read this has spread also to Norway um, and possibly Sweden, um, a series of citizens patrols called the Soldiers of Odin were um, created, appealing, you know, speaking of the fetish, appealing to the god of Germanic and Norse mythology. Here they are patrolling the streets of Joensuu. Um, however, the residents of one Finnish city, Tampere, decided to unmask the soldiers um, by literally donning masks, clown masks to be precise, creating a parallel set of citizens' patrols, the soldiers of Loden a set of clandestine clown patrols um, that took to the streets in January and have continued to secure the city with the slogan, evil things may scare you, but you cannot fight monsters with evil. And I would add to that, just as you cannot dispel today's multiple challenges to Europe, political, social, economic, and yes, also cultural identitary, by recourse to monsters and to fetish. So I will leave you with the clowns. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Louise. I love this one. Seek fail. It's, it's a it's a wonderful. <laughs> Yes, it's wonderful. So thank you uh, for this um, delightful uh, talk on a topic which is causing us lots of concern, uh, but a talk which spans uh, medieval Venice to uh, today's the clowns. clowns. <laughs> right. And with that, let me just open the floor and ask for uh, questions, comments. Folk. Yes, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. I just have uh, yes, two questions, perhaps. Uh, the first question is, you talked about the right of visibility or the right to appear in urban spaces. Where does this right come from? Is it possibly a part of the right of the freedom of religion? Because migration, as we see it now, uh, happening in Germany and elsewhere, it does not only mean the migration of people and ideas and faith and lifestyles, but it could also mean the migration of an architectural expression of religious faith. And um, it seems also to work the other way around. I read in the newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung two days ago that Turkish citizens who lived 30 or 40 years in Germany when they go back to Turkey, they build houses with their money they saved, uh, 
And these houses look like German houses in the countryside. So the article told me that um, large parts of Turkey look like uh, the German province. So it seems to be a need of, to express one's lifestyle or one's religion also in architecture, in building a mosque. That's one point. But the other point is that a public space has, from my understanding, a normative dimension. And it's not only a place and, and houses and so on. And if it has a normative dimension, it's really interesting who decides who has the right to appear in this public space. And is it not, not a necessity to renegotiate the use of public space in the process of an ongoing migration? I mean, that, that was wonderful, and I'm very glad you raised these points because um, I think they were probably implicit in my mind in thinking a lot you know, about a lot of these questions. So I'm very glad that you brought them up. Um, I think uh, you know, the question that you raise about who has the right to decide what appears in public spaces in the city or elsewhere, um, you know, and, and the fact that public space does have a normative direction, that is decided and it is not only decided in formal institutional terms through you know planning guidelines and so on there's a broader kind of normative understanding of what is acceptable and what is not even that which is not legislated upon so i mean you know we could talk about um uh, the debates around you know ban banning the full veil in public spaces etc cetera, etc cetera. but this is you know this is a much broader i think discussion that you're raising um and who makes that decision and the fact that yes you do need to negotiate it as and or you know in theory you should renegotiate it as the community is changing, which is what I, I believe you were hinting at. Um, so, you know, certainly, I mean, I can speak about the Italian case. And Venice is a very strange place for this because in, in many ways, not just the exhibit, but the city itself is a fake. And I mean, I say that as somebody who has lived there for 10 years and everybody kind of decries the disnification of the city. So this idea of preserving, but it, you know, kind of preserving an authentic Venice is absurd. But in that sense, I think it, it, it's a very good kind of view into exactly this kind of process that you're talking about. Because there, you know, the absurdity of preserving some original essence, some original set of architectures, behaviors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, becomes so evident that it is, you know, absurd that it's, you know, holding on to something, to some essence that was, you know, never unique, never, you know, as pure as we imagine it. Um, and I think these are the discussions that we should be having and we're not having. And I think uh, the reason that I wanted to focus on, you know, why it is a problem to make this into a fetish is that we remove these discussions. We make it about a particular place that can be, you know, discarded, removed, whether it's the headscarf or whether it's the building of a mosque, rather than talking, you know, about these, you know, kind of political choices. And they are political choices, but it's much easier to focus um, you know, on the fetish. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I don't have an answer, but I think our, our political leaders should. So. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, reaction from the Muslim community, which started using uh, this exhibit as an actual mosque. Uh, when at some point, um, either they knew from the very beginning that it, it is not a real mosque, because you know, you know, it could be, it could have been very carefully reconstructed, but it wasn't a functioning mosque, right? Uh, and if they didn't know from the very beginning, they probably learned about it uh, from the press uh, when the whole controversy broke out. So my my question is, how did they react to that to this? Because this also touches upon uh, this secular sacred dimension, right? If the Muslims, uh, devout Muslims, started using an art exhibit as an actual temple, this is also, in a sense, an artistic act, right? So my, I, I would love to learn more about this. Well, I mean, I think this is like a great question because uh, the, the interviews that I read on the local newspapers, and again, I went there with the intention of actually spending a week in Venice interviewing people, taking pictures rather than, you know, the iPhone snapshots, and the whole thing, you know, 
kind of vanished before my eyes, unfortunately. But in the interviews that were given on the local papers, most people who had gone there, and this is the local residents working in Venice, because interestingly enough, many Muslim tourists also used it during that week for prayers. They just expressed disbelief, saying, I can't believe this was allowed, that this is here. You know, kind of let's use it while it's here. But very much saying, okay, you know, we will actively make use of, of this space, knowing full well that it is um, a performance. Um, so I know, I mean, that doesn't, you know, answer your question, but they were very much part of, in a sense, I mean, and I don't want to kind of overstate the case, in claiming a right to space, in claiming a right, you know, to be to using this, this space that was provided for them. And in Buchel's previous installation in London, I mean, he did something very similar. He created a community center um, that was open, um, you know, to people who are homeless, to other people who would otherwise go to a community center. Only again, this was, and the, the, there it was even more outrageous because it was, it was made inside a swanky art gallery that was now, you know, kind of converted to, um, to a community center. So, you know, um, we could say that it was, you know, kind of a, an explicitly political performative act of claiming the space, saying, okay, yes. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 d I don't want to kind of ascribe to it um, things that perhaps were not there. So, but I think it's a very important question. <coughs> Um, uh, for a thing to be visible, uh, it must be present. Uh, so, it ha but you, it can't be present uh, historically until unless it's represented. So there's presence, represents. Now. You could have the representation in the old-fashioned way of, um, you know, artifacts, paintings, historical representation, Aristotle's, Mimesis, uh, where the representations and what they represent are not cate are, are, are categorically different. But in this case, what you seem to be suggesting is that there is a reenactment a reenactment of a past to make itself visible where the visibility and the fetishism fetishism gosh these words are difficult um, uh, is 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 not to use another psychoanalytical uh, category um, uh, what's what's not remembered uh, may be repeated in the process of, of psychoanalysis uh, unconsciously um, during, during a particular therapeutic situation. So is, is, this, is this resentment really therapy of remembering, representing unconsciously enacting a past which is not in vitro but in vivo. I would go with the anthropological understanding of fetish rather than the psychoanalytic. Um, maybe because it makes me more <laughs> comfortable, and I like you know um, I like it more in the sense because there is also that kind of you know physicality and the need you know I think of almost of a voodoo doll that you just need to somehow um, stick pins into. Um, I I think there is certainly that, and of course you know the historical past. I mean you know we just heard a wonderful actually presentation from Susanna yesterday about you know how. Um, you exhibit otherness, especially old otherness, <laughs> in a very safe fashion. Okay, so um, Venice has no problem in you know exhibiting a Byzantine um, architecture, and it's tie. It makes so much of its ties to the East and of being there to Constantinople. The Easterners at the gates today are something quite different. Um, so that's that's very much the case. Um, 
if it's you know kind of a, a, a way to kind of to exercise that, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that um, I've been talking to one of my PhD students about, who's an art historian, is this notion of translatio, and you know, in a sense. The, the Venetians of the 10th, 11th, 12th century were much better at this than we are. You know, I mean, they, you know, they, they were quite explicit in what they did with their fetishes okay? um, and in, in their kind of relationship to otherness. I mean, they put it in a nice kind of sarcophagus. And um, I think, uh, you know, um, I'm still kind of trying to figure out how I can, you know, connect that to today, this process of translatio. Um, but yes, I think those, both those dynamics are there. Um, and I, you know, as far as, uh, I mean, I could go into all kinds of other psychoanalytical um, digressions looking at some of the flyers and posters that I <laughs> showed you, but I'd rather not go there. Uh. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Louise. I, I want to make an unsystematic but a short observation and a uh, suggestion. The uh, clowns are brilliant and very funny, and it's a good way of challenging the, 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 these fetishes. And it's also good to uh, challenge the, the, these fetishes uh, intellectually within Italian or German uh, society. But I think the key to uh, fight against the, 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 this kind of intolerance or fetishism is to empower migrants themselves. Uh, they're not just objects of this, uh, you know, being subjected to some kind of intolerance or repression. But they should also, uh, they should be empowered to fight. Uh, th that's probably the only way to defeat uh, this. But the, the problem with, I know migrants hardly have any rights, uh, and, you know, etc. But uh, they should be empowered, I think, in intellectually. Uh, they, they should uh, challenge this, these, these, these kind of repression intellectually, not only by appealing to European uh, values, because it's extremely easy for you, the administrations to turn, turn it back, like using, uh, citing health and safety concerns to, to do it. You, know, you cannot fight against health and safety in many Western societies. Uh, so there are always ways. So the way they should be empowered and should challenge the authorities, should, they should draw on their own uh, experiences. In the, from the past, like uh, from early Muslim societies and uh, other places. But the problem with that is more of the, many of the places where these migrants are coming from, uh, the, the um, intolerance is way higher than uh, it's happening in, uh, you know, in Venice. You know, Christians are persecuted uh, or Muslims themselves like, are persecuted because they're not Muslim enough. Uh, so they hardly have any kind of tools, intellectual tools, to challenge uh, any kind of uh, discrimination they're, they've been subjected to, because they, uh, they, they're not coming from societies where discrimination is, is wrong. They are probably discriminating other people back, back at home. So, I, I, I mean, I, I just wondered what you might think about empowering the, the migrants. Not for that, because I think it goes directly, actually, to your points about, you know, who has the right to make these decisions about what our city should look like visually, but also what should be the rules of public conduct, for example. And you mentioned, you know, the um, unfortunately much abused idea phrase of European values. What are these? Okay. How do we have a conversation about them that is not exclusionary? that accepts a conversation and yet that preserves some of you know, these values. Um, how can that happen? I mean, how can we really have a conversation about what our cities should look like today and who has the right to do what, behave how? And you know, I think w one of the reasons that I brought up the examples um, you know, from uh, the kind of media reaction to Cologne is that there was this presumption that you know, sexual violence was only limited to this population, which is absurd. And that instruction should be geared at this population. And one of the things that I didn't want to do, because I didn't want to be offensive to my hosts, is, I mean, if you skim through any of the, you know, kind of local tabloid newspapers, you would read about all the new kind of instructional material, signs in public pools, kind of, you know, teaching um, the new migrants how to behave in public spaces. And um, I think just yesterday, there was a pamphlet published on, you know, kind of giving this kind of instructional um, 
series of kind of uh, behaviors. I mean, this is not new. In the Netherlands, um, where I live and teach right now, the Dutch integration exam is very much about that. This is an exam that people have to pass before applying for visas, before traveling to the Netherlands. And along you know, with uh, lessons in language, in you know, the history of the country, there's literally a set of lessons in tolerance and Dutch values. And a lot has been written on this exam because it has become, unfortunately, a model for other such exams in Europe, um, you know, spanning the range of, you know, kind of tolerance of sexual diversity, women's rights, you know, again, behavior in public spaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you do that um, in non, let's say, kind of discriminatory colonial fashion? I mean, how do you have this kind of open debate? I think that's the question. I mean, what I, as a geographer, can do is kind of, you know, hopefully at least, you know, in, in the one hour today, is point to, <laughs> I think, some of the problems that we have in reducing what is a very important debate to a spatial fetish, to whether it's, you know, an, an individual set of events or an individual set of places rather than thinking about the broader kind of political questions we should be answer, asking. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'll just give it. Louisa, just uh, to follow up and come back to Folke's uh, question right at the beginning, um, because I think uh, you began with uh, the question of uh, the mosque and the presence of a mosque here as an art object, but of course uh, it might be interesting to relate that to uh, mosques um, which are being debated or which had been debated very strongly both in Austria and um, in uh, Switzerland and in Germany. Uh, the Cologne uh, story was about um, uh, where a mosque could be built and what it should look like. The Swiss referendum uh, was about uh, the height of the, uh, yes, and here of course, and this, this is the interesting um, uh, question around it, uh, when Volker was raising the question, who has the right to decide, of course the only ones who are not allowed to vote on the referendum are the ones who are going to use the mosque because they are the ones uh, uh, who uh, don't have the citizenship uh, rights in order to be part of the referendum. But more um, uh, importantly, the interesting fact on the distribution of uh, votes on this uh, particular uh, question was uh, the cantons in which uh, the least number of migrants, especially Muslim migrants, live are the ones which were the most vehemently opposed to having a min uh, minaret, which was uh, higher than. And that was the second um, uh, question, was whether a minaret should could be higher than a church tower. So it was always about in, in relation to the height of the church tower that the visibility had to be negotiated. And I think those are the kinds of questions which give us very interesting indications of um, when real mosques are to be built, uh, what are the kinds of questions which arise uh, around uh, the visibility of uh, religions and um, other religions, uh, except for Christianity, in what is supposed to be a secular Europe. those debates, it becomes just about Islam. It doesn't become about religion. And, I mean, if you say that, you know, that's what everybody assumes you're going to be talking about. So, I mean, I think, you know, again, to, to go back to your um, early points, I think that's, you know, that's the conversation that we should be having. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the words performative representation and reenactment have been uh, mentioned a few times uh, in the context of uh, Venice where exhibiting otherness as you may well known 
has quite a long uh, tradition. Absolutely. We see it in Carlo Goldoni's La Dalmatina, where, in fact, Goldoni deals with the contemporary equivalent of uh, the Cologne events. In fact, it is the abduction of uh, women from uh, the Absolutely. different sides of the Mediterranean. The Adriatic, exactly. Yes. And uh, um, under the line that gently rules. Uh, yes, what uh, is fascinating about uh, the reports of the performances of Goldoni's Dalmatina is how well the Dalmati and uh, others who are on board on a ship uh, react very positively to their representations on the Venetian uh, stage. So this reminded me of your words of the magic spell that is broken. And uh, in Venice's case, it's the f one of the few medieval cities that has never burned a heretic. It is also the city of the carnival. Mm -hmm. So my first question is really, what is it about Venice that allows this yeah. more than any others? And the second one is the role of humor. Yeah. How does this allow us to deflate and how does this allow us to break the spell? And uh, why do some people have such a problem with it? Thank you for that, and thank you for bringing up Goldoni, who I didn't think about at all. But you're right. I mean, it's you know, it's it's very much there, and Venice's relationship with these various others, in this case, with the Dalmatian coast and those who inhabited it, um, was um, enacted in various ways, not just in architecture, in the spolia, but through various theatrical representations that were not just performed in the theaters; they were performed very much on the city streets. And a number of cultural geographers, um, Dennis Cosgrove most importantly, have written about the spectacle of the city and how the whole city was built as a theater for the um, uh, presentation of Venetian power. Um, St. Mark's Square with its processions that literally, you know, kind of figuratively enacted, um, you know, kind of Venice's um, uh, both kind of power and power of lands, but also its power structure at home. So, I mean, that was very much there. It was the ideal set, but it built itself as a set. I mean, in that, and in this sense, you know, what you're saying is very true. It is a unique case. And I think that's, you know, apart from the fact, you know, that there, you know, this, this exhibition took place in Venice, it seemed to me as such a great context to try to unpick it, not just through the exhibit, but because the city, as you're very rightly pointing out, is itself this kind of theatrical um, stage set, and not just because, as, you know, as I mentioned before, um, it is very much a tourist city um, that has been depopulating for many, many years now. Um, the carnival, it's true, I didn't, you know, I didn't think of that connection. Um, and um, the role of humor, um, I... I guess, you know, and I'll, I'll throw this back at you because, I mean, you know, um, I'm a geographer. I do space. I, you know, I don't do these kind of the things that anthropologists and sociologists are much better at, which is, you know, kind of thinking through, <laughs> um, for example, the uses of the fetish and the uses of humor. Um, the way that, you know, I liked um, the clowns and, you know, just as I liked in the notion of the fetish is... Um, precisely because they take you away from what we assume to be real properties, closed properties of spaces. They have that suspension of belief, right? Um, and so, you know, they remove us from the political, cultural, identitary categories, for a moment at least. I mean, we know it's play, but at least, you know, that suspension, that moment of suspension, whether humorous or otherwise, breaks the spell. Um, how we could take this further? You tell me. As I said, I do space. Uh, thank you, Lisa. It's always uh, uh, enjoying to, to listen to, to your talks. Uh, maybe two, two small, uh, rather small questions. First, you mentioned, mentioned uh, t the term substitution. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, it's, again, psychoanalytical a little bit. Fortunately, uh, it yeah. is, yes. <laughs> the question is, uh, what substitutes uh, what? Yeah? And maybe if we uh, speculate in political terms, uh, would, I, would I be completely wrong if I suggest that uh, 
the substitution in this context is uh, or relates to uh, redirection of public attention from real problems to uh, some uh, fake ones. For example, uh, the reality on the ground, uh, uh, which related, uh, relates to migration, is, uh, you know, high level of uh, uh, unemployment, bad education, uh, limited uh, uh, social mobility, and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, but uh, what we see uh, in media is something quite different. Yeah, headscarf affair. Uh, uh, and some so symbolic symbolic uh, uh, issues inst instead of uh, uh, social tensions, social mm -hmm. uh, contradictions, and so on. And uh, another point is: uh, Would I be completely wrong if I suggest that this uh, putative conflict between? Uh, conflict over le legitimacy between secular state and religion, yeah, and this, uh, you know, compet competitiveness yeah, between secularism mm -hmm. and uh, uh, religion, but uh, it is rather about appearance, emergence of transnational spaces mm -hmm. which could not be placed within a nation, a state, a national society and so on. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think I think that this question of the transnational spaces is really important. But let me let me go to this, the first question that you raised about um, substitution and whether it is you know just we're simply substituting a fake problem for a real one. I wouldn't say that because I don't think these are fake problems. I mean, people are upset by, you know, certain manifestations of religious clothing, the presence of, you know, places of religious worship that they don't know in their midst, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's more, so I wouldn't draw the real fake distinction, and I think that's why looking at a fake mosque <laughs> is so useful in this sense, because I don't, it complicates that distinction. Um, I think with this idea of the fetish, I wanted you know, to get us to think about how focusing on one specific space, event, individual allows us to kind of gather all of, you know, the much broader kind of questions into this one, in this case, site. And thinking that if we eliminate the space, that all will be well, and we don't have the discussions that, you know, that you are raising about not just how do we deal with um, migration, but, you know, why, as many speakers <laughs> on this very stage have said in the past months, why is this refugee wave with us today? I mean, we're not raising those questions. So I think it allows us, you know, to focus down once more on a specific event, specific person, specific site. Um, I think, you know, this question of, you know, if, if we're dealing uh, here with... Um, transnational spaces, as, as you say, or somehow this problematic spillage. I think one of the reasons for which I also like the idea of the fetish is that it's, you know, it's this idea of enclosure and this assumption that we can still bound spaces, that we can still preserve the essence of Venice, you know, whether it's an appeals to the Madonna or other sort of imaginaries. Um, that we can, you know, preserve it from, you know, if we use the, the words of the citizens' committees, from pollution by these foreign influences. I mean, that's, you know, it's an absurdity, but yet, you know, I mean, that's exactly the language of somehow preserving the essence of places. The physical, architectural essence, but also the essence of, you know, what may be um, European values and, you know, wh whatever those may be when, you know, as it pertains to... Um, our streets and our city spaces. So I think that's, you know, that's very much there. So um, I don't know if that answers your question fully, but that, you know, also, I mean, the kind of the question of secularism, again, begin, you know, be, becomes immediately tied to others' secularism or lack of secularism, <laughs> not our own. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to remind you that by coincidence, uh, this year is the 500th anniversary 
of the Venice ghetto. Yes. Now, if we learn something from that, we will see that, in effect, we're talking here about two completely different issues. One issue is the right of a minority mm -hmm. to express themselves. Yeah. The other issue is that the minority wants part of what the majority has owned for many, many years. Mm -hmm. That means what you have here mm -hmm. is not the right to have a mosque somewhere in a suburb of uh, Venice. Right. If there is something like that. But the right to take over a church and plant there a mosque, this is a conquest. Now, look, I lived many years in New York. Harlem has changed. The synagogues emptied. No particular reason. People like to live in better conditions somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They were sold to the black Christians that came from the South. No problem whatsoever. In effect, there are joint events that old people that remember mm -hmm. the original synagogues come on certain days of the year to celebrate in the location with the Baptist black uh, new uh, right. members of the community. That is a positive approach. But coming in with prejudices that were uh, learned for hundreds of years outside somewhere in the Middle East, to come with that to Venice and to try to actually impose through the, the benevolence mm. of the Italians to take part in something that those Italians have built. Now, you mentioned that there is a Europe. There is no Europe. There is no European culture. There are maybe 55 nationalities in Europe. If not more, yes. Well, I mean, because each country has many nationalities in it. Now, all what the migrants could and should be allowed to aspire to is to be recognized as an additional minority with rights to fit into a big pool mm -hmm. rather than playing along with them and having Muslim schools where the prejudices are taught to next generation right here in Vienna. Now, are you ready to tackle this kind of a subject rather than look into our own secular humanists that we like to see a nice world, but we live in a very, very, very bad world. And the issue is if we are realistic enough to tackle the problem as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for throwing some no, wrenches I, into your... No, 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 but I think, you know, and I'm glad that you brought uh, up the ghetto because, of course, you know, Venice and its beautiful history of, you know, wonderful relations with the Orient and all its various others, you know, had a very important ghetto. And speaking of spatial, spatial segregation... Basically, yeah. the life was acceptable. And, you know, the, the, the interesting thing that has happened with the ghetto right now is that having become a tourist landmark, because that is now, it has become uh, one of the kind of the key tourist sites in Venice, I mean, there's a lot of debate about what is happening there right now in terms of, again, these, you know, processes of disnification and um, re recreations of a particular past that certainly was not as it is being presented today. Um, but to go back to your, you know, kind of other points, um, I think, you know, we must be clear in saying here, this is not people claiming that space. This was an artistic exhibit that, as, um, as Pavel asked me, you know, since it was there, the local community began using it. And, you know, again, all the interviews with people who actually went in there to pray, they, they were literally amazed. Is there is this buy? place here. Did they buy? Excuse me? Did they buy it like it happened in Harlem? Did no, no, I mean, this was, but this was an exhibit. It was a temporary exhibit. It was an art exhibit. It was just for an exhibit. This was, an, it was entirely exhibition. Okay, it's just an exhibition. That's it. 
ex it was it was there just as an artistic exhibit. And the you know the reason that I'm saying that it is a fetish is because even though it was fake, it was not a real mosque. Um, the reaction to it, you know, really I think made us think about these issues. And I think these are questions that we need to ask. And you know, the your colleagues sitting behind you, I think, very rightly raised them at the very start. This is a political discussion that needs to take place regarding what are the rights of various minorities. Do we consider them minorities? How? I mean, you know, uh, how are those um, how are those decided? Political rights, but also rights to space, rights to the city, um, and that has to happen at the national scale because cities, you know, despite um, the etymology of the word citizenship, do not have the rights to grant citizenship or refuge or asylum. Maybe they should. Many people think they they should, and there's a long tradition of that. But these are debates, even though they play out in city spaces, that very much need to be debated by the national state, and in this case also by Europe, although that has failed miserably. So. Yeah, Louisa, this was so interesting. Um, one way in which it was interesting, it seems to me, just to begin with a comment, was the way in which all these, there's so many different frames or categories that you've been emerging both in your talk and then in the discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fetish, well, that's a religious term, um, though, as we've been saying, also psychoanalytic and also anthropologists use it, Marx uses it. Mm -hmm. There's negotiation was mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's the frame of, well, clearly religion, politics. How are we to think about this? This is what your, quest, your, your talk raised. But I want to ask you a question about actually Venice and mm. what happened there. I mean, this was, this exhibition was performance art, as it were. It was, it was an artistic intervention. I have no idea, maybe you can tell us what the Icelandic artist and the Atlantic authorities had in mind, what they intended. But at any rate, they did this and then the local population of, Mus of Muslims took advantage of the situation to, 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 to act religiously and then there was the, the reaction of the, um, the Lega del Nord and the, and the, and the, and the politicians mm -hmm. and the political activists who were deeply opposed to this, all this against the background of a, of a conflict, of, of a situation of tension and conflict mm -hmm. in, in Venice. So I guess my question is, well, first of all, was this a good idea? I mean, did it, did it, did it um, actually... Um, did it produce something like productive in Venice? Was this, was this a, I mean, it's generated mm -hmm. a hugely interesting, I mean, very interesting discussion among us. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what about there and in Italy more generally? Was this, was this productive, do you think? I mean, first of all, was it productive and, and do you think it's likely to be? As, <laughs> and as in an what ways <laughs> it <Yeah>. was? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, to, to kind of, to go back to the, the, the first part of your question, so, um, when this project was being conceived by Buchel, who is Swiss, even though he did this on behalf of the Icelandic pavilion, he did it in consultation with the Iceland Association of Muslims and the local Muslim association in Venice. So it involved them from the start in creating the space, also so it would follow you know, the proper religious um, architecture attributes and so on. Um, so it's, you know, it's not that this thing appeared out of nowhere and they're like, oh, a mosque, <laughs> we'll go, you know, we'll go start using it. I mean, there was a, a process of dialogue. And in fact, before the mosque, I mean, the, the mosque was supposed to last from May through November, but it was shut down. And through that summer, actually, the head of the Associ Association of Icelandic Muslims were supposed to preside over the mosque. I mean, he was about to arrive in Venice when the thing was shut down. So there was going to be actually an imam that was going to come and preside over this installation. So the idea was it was going to be a public debate? Yes. In some way. Yes, it Even was very much. And I mean, and Buhal has done that before. So, I mean, I, am, I did not see his previous installation. I don't know if anybody in the room has the, the community center, the Piccadilly Community Center in London, where he was very much criticized for that as well. Because on the one hand, he was saying, I'm providing a space, a very you know, useful space in the city for those with no space. Um, you know, and he would serve, you know, food, tea. I mean, it became a functioning community space. Um, 
you know, again, to, there to raise awareness about other sorts of lack of rights to the city. And here, I think the intention, his intention was that, and also, you know, as he claimed, to remind people, and this goes to your question, Jyoti, about, you know, this kind of longer histories of Venice's ties to the Far East, but going directly, you know, to the ties with Muslim lands, not just Byzantium, which to most people doesn't smell Muslim, right? So it's, you know, Byzantium is safe, even Constantinople, you know, it's far enough from Istanbul today to kind of to have that kind of symbolic distance. Whether it was productive, it generated a lot of hate, so, and, you know, the sort of manifestations that I was showing you in part. Um, I would say yes, though, even though it brought out, you know, um, all these various citizens, spontaneous citizens committees with, you know, lots of hateful speech, very kind of exclusionary language. Um, and maybe also, you know, because it was in Venice, where anything goes, you know, anything can happen to a point. So it wasn't the carnival, it wasn't other things. It was this. I mean, there were plenty of other interesting events at the Biennale. The Biennale itself, I mean, the title was All the World's Futures, um, was built around Marx's capital. The reading of the capital was one of the events. And, you know, very kind of provocative exhibitions of, you know, in all sorts of ways. But this was the one that really, you know, um, kind of uh, put, put the knife into the, the Venetian um, public. So I guess uh, that's, that's a kind of knee <laughs> answer. Mm -hmm. I think it was productive because it provoked a political debate mm -hmm. that was much needed, um, even in its, you know, kind of violent and hateful manifestations. Um, what has been left of it, I mean, you know, the new mosque that's being built, I mean, the debates that are happening right now are very much, you know, kind of the legacy of what happened in the city centre. Um, but, the, I mean, it's, it's interesting because there, again, because it's being built among the car dealerships, you know, driving from the Venice airport, you won't even notice it. Um, because I think, you know, the, the minaret <laughs> has been scaled down. So it, you know, contributed very much to that. And also, I think, um, the, the city authorities that shut it down, um, there, was, there was also kind of a strong debate there, because there is this idea that Venice is somehow different from the Veneto. Because um, the Veneto region is very much a rural region. It was in the times of the Venetian Republic. It still is today. Now it's a para-urbanized rural region with you know, some of the most... Um, uh, at least, you know, 10 years ago, really kind of the, the booming kind of industrial districts of Europe. All your fancy clothes from diesel to, you know, pick your brand come from the Venetian countryside, okay? Um, in, or at least used to un, until those factories were offshored. But it is a profoundly conservative region and always has been. It's been, you know, kind of the, the backbone of the Lega support, while Venice was always a red city with um, a very different sort of municipal administration that thought of itself as precisely different, open, cosmopolitan, you pick the term. And suddenly here it revealed itself to be very much prey to the same kind of impulses. So there was a lot of, you know, oh, we're so embarrassed that this happened from local politicians from the city, not from the region. So in that sense, perhaps useful as well. Well, thank you very much for this uh, provocative talk. Uh, uh, I meant to ask the question differently, but I want to follow up on this mm -hmm. last question. Was this productive? Mm -hmm. And I want to generalize, maybe, maybe try to generalize from the Harlem and uh, Venice to a bigger question, and that is that, you know, uh, the focus of your talk uh, with, with the angle of fetish is, on, of course, on, on this, this population, this... Uh, ideology, this religion that has been mm -hmm. fetishized and so on, but as you correctly pointed out, there's the flip side, that is that there's, there are legitimate concerns and fears sure. in the local population in Europe yeah. about some of these issues, the Cone being, being, the, being the most recent example. So here's a question for you as a, as a geographer, because you think about space. Uh, if, if this was 
this was maybe productive, maybe it was not, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it, it was productive in the sense that you just described, you know, it opened the wound, so to speak, for, mm -hmm. for, yeah. uh, for the Venetians, right? But Absolutely. how about the rest of us, the rest of Europe, right? And uh, if we were to, to think about it from this broader angle, the question is, can we th think of more, maybe, alternative spaces mm -hmm. or utopian spaces, whatever you call them, where these wounds are, rather than being basically opened up, uh, are maybe kind of treated. Uh, I, don't, I can't think of a better term. You know, uh, how can we think more creatively about, yeah. about spaces that bring people together? Because the only spaces that, that are currently available for these two different views, or uh, <laughs> more than two different views, to come together is spaces of clash and conflict. You know, that's where we see, you know, in, you know, in current public spaces in Europe, sure. mo happening most of the time, right? Are there creative ways of thinking about alternative spaces rather than the church and the mosque and, and the, the plaza yeah. uh, where we can enable conversation, which, is, which was apparently suggested by some of, some of the people in the audience. No, and, and I think that's exactly the question because along with the political discussion that needs to take place, that has to do with laws, that has to do with, you know, kind of a broader debate um, regarding, you know, kind of questions of legality, questions of rights. Um, I think we need to be having another set of debates regarding, you know, what we want our cities to look like and how do we create these spaces. Um, and I think the two have to go together. Absolutely. So it doesn't just become about, you know, these kinds of conflictual um, spaces. That, and, and some spaces are by nature conflictual. That's what they're meant to be. They are exclusivist and exclusionary. Um, so how do we create other um, spaces? And, and I know there's a couple of people in the room who've been thinking about that. So I'm, I'm not going to pick on you, but I think I know there are a lot of people working um, in very interesting ways, um, both geographers, spatial planners, but also artists and various urban interveners in, you know, kind of thinking about how we can do this. And I wanted to end with the clowns, because in a sense, the clowns do just that. Um, but for them, it's, I mean, it's a temporary moment. It's not, you know, the clowns will not, unfortunately, solve the problems of Europe. They may make us smile and at least make us smile at the soldiers of Odin, which is already a good thing. Um, but that's exactly it, is we need to not just imagine other spaces, but make them. So, yeah. Katha, I need to no, go down. Do you want a last no, question? No, it's okay. Oh, okay. So thank you very, very much, Louisa. Uh, let me just echo um, uh, Stephen's uh, question uh, to you. It's been an extremely productive discussion, uh, which yes, uh, the you. fetish uh, of um, the mosque uh, has provided this afternoon. And thank you very, very much thank you. for a wonderful talk and the discussion. Now, of course, there is an alternative space, which is the <laughs> one below this one and mm -hmm. there is wine and cheese there as usual so i hope we can continue the discussion there thank you very much thank you very much and thank you for your question thank you Shelley.